Hello, everyone. Um, it's a Sunday afternoon, and uh, we are here today for uh, Chaturi Nisan Sala's presentation, uh, When Flesh Fades Away. So um, I'll uh, first welcome you all to today's uh, session. And uh, thank you so much for being with us uh, throughout this past few weeks. And uh, it's the fifth week we are doing the presentation uh, series as part of the ongoing exhibition, Crafting the Crossroad at The Art Space, Hyderabad. Uh, so uh, some of you who are uh, attending all our sessions, you know that uh, this talk series we are doing as um, as we know that you know there are so many stories behind a, an artwork, behind uh, an artist's practice. So we thought that we can bring the artists on this platform and uh, share their uh, stories, uh, their experience, their practice. So it's it's uh, it's an opportunity for our audience to directly connect to them. Uh, so we'll welcome today. Uh, Chaturi, Chaturi Nisan Sala from Sri Lanka. Currently, she is in Colombo. Um, before I formally invite her, I'll just try to uh, introduce her to you. I'll just read out a few lines about her, though the person is really very, very colorful, more than what I'm going to read out from the so called bio note. Uh, the person is really a very vibrant one. Um, okay, so Chaturi Nisan Sala is a multidisciplinary artist based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, a recipient of the Commonwealth Scholarship Southeast Asia by the, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Uh, Nisan Sala acquired a bachelor's in painting from Karnataka Chitrakala Parishad, Bangalore in 2017 and a master's degree from Maharaja Sayaji Rao University, Vadodara, in 2019. She has performed and exhibited across Asia. Some of her participations include a solo exhibition, Ritualizing the Disfigured Memorials of Healing from Sri Lanka, by Anand Art, Delhi, Rehang, curated by Uttara Rajagopal, and hosted by Anand Art at Bikani House, Delhi, in 2021. Responses to Memory, curated by Urja Garg at Gilheri Arts Initiative in 2020, and uh, the 15th virtual con concert celebrating Women's Month in South Africa, curated by Bernadette Mutien uh, in 2020, among others. Currently, she is carrying out her uh, apprenticeship under artist Somapala Putupitiye and learning the traditional practice of costume making at Mulagama Art Center in Sri Lanka. Uh, that's about Chaturi Nisan Sala from Sri Lanka. Uh, welcome Chaturi, welcome to today's talk. And uh, you know, it's, it's so glad to uh, meet you again on the virtual platform. Chaturi came for the opening of the show, Cracking the Crossroad, and she did a uh, a very, very powerful uh, performance on the opening day. Mm, I think Chaturi would like to talk about that as well. Uh, so yeah, now over to Chaturi. The stage is all I, yours. Uh, yeah, so I'll just sort of, uh, in the beginning, I'll just have a video conversation on the video, but there's a network issue happening here at Colombo. So I might have to off the video at certain points. Um, and so hopefully, so thank you so much for Medatta and the art space, space um, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, yeah, and I'm uh, back in Colombo and uh, would like to carry. I mean, it's uh, it was a great experience to be there and doing a performance at the opening of the art space, this exhibition crafting the crossroads. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think, uh, should we go ahead with the... Uh, Chaturi, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah. Yes, I can see. Okay. 
so i uh, i could just tell uh, someone to sort of uh, move with the screens like the slides so yeah so this entire series uh, that i have worked on was under this topic uh, for uh, called when flesh fades away all you are left with the memory of them um it's it begins with this uh, the entire series work before uh, started with the idea of um, a series before that i was working on on my mother's archives on my mother's memory how she sort of uh, lived within the period or uh, during the war uh, from 1983 to 1989 and uh, where i was connecting with the archives then i moved to colombo uh, in 2019 and i started i moved to mulegama art center which is uh, actually a vision by the artist palapotu kutia and uh, he wanted to connect the traditional artisans with the contemporary artists and there i met uh, his father uh, pal uh, somapala potupitiya so it was uh, under both so somapala potupitiya and pala potupitiya i sort of uh, got into the traditional art scene of sri lanka uh, especially the southern region so let's move into the next slide uh, if i talk about uh, hello sorry sir there was some uh, network issues uh, let me just uh, try again okay so let me just give you an introduction about the purpose so in sri lanka uh, they what we are looking at is actually a performative tradition it's called the curative tradition a curative means healing and as you uh, if you see uh, throughout coastal area of sri lanka we have a different forms and uh, forms of art that is coming up and uh, if you look at the southern ritualistic tradition here is a glimpse of a scenery displayed at the national museum of sri lanka where you see uh, this tradition is been shown so curative tradition is actually about healing uh it is also there are other aesthetical elements that are connected to it so there is a set of mass tradition we connect with the demons and the cosmic entities that are around so what people believed at that time is even now that uh, why we are getting these sicknesses and ailments we call the sunni uh is because of these sort of imbalances that are happening in the cosmic cosmology but also because of these entities that are around us so there are types of de different demons and there are types of forms of this uh, branches in the same tradition uh if you move to the next slide uh i could show you so if you see the bottom half uh, of south part of sri lanka here this is called the southern uh, uh, part of sri lanka where this tradition is prevalent so after colombo uh, you move to kalutara so from kalutara you move to bentara so from bentara the entire coastal line up to mathura ambalan thota is this entire area where you see this tradition is connected and if i look at the curative tradition there are these three distinctive branches which fall according to the areas which is bentara ambalangoda and mathura so these are three different areas or localities that is this uh, you, but in within them also there are certain variations but these are the three distinct branches according to topographies of sri lanka that they have found mother is considered as one of the most deep rooted so if we look at this tradition it prevails back to the time of our ancient uh, ancestors uh, there is a belief that the roots are moved towards um, the early predecessors of the uh, you know the cultures of the rakshasas and yakshas then there is also a hybridization and that we can see later uh, which uh, certain elements of orissa uh, kerala that also started moving like have influences and then we can see uh, with the colonial influences so more that this tradition starts moving more hybridized uh, you see a uh, certain uh, theater like no um, we call it kolam and all that enter even the attire sort of changing as well so this entire tradition itself is very hybrid and moving um 
the demons and the textile uh, are connected to each other. Um, the demons are connected as entities that are living amongst us. So we are not actually repelling them. We are sort of uh, living coexisting with each of, each of them. Can you move to the next slide? So if you see this image, it's actually uh, a structure of Tovil. Tovil is like a structure that is connect, uh, created. Uh, it's like a, 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 an area, it's like an installation which all these structures that are uh, made of uh, banana, coconut, co uh, parts of the coconut uh, tree and banana tree, and they kind of create this entire structure around and where the demon in you know the installation, this performance happened. So this is an image uh, courtesy by artist Pala Potipitya. He recently had uh, done a Sunni dance uh, performance at his hometown and he's um, and if you can see that, it's an entire structure that they create to have these performances. And this structure, there's a, me a distinct measurement, there's a, a distinct symbolism that is connected within this tradition. Um, can we move to the next slide? So this is more than 200 years old, uh, like there is no uh, exact timeline when it started. Uh, and to be a proper master of this tradition, one must have uh, learned all the mastery for around 20 years of time. And uh, Somapala Potopitiya falls under uh, the Namandani caste. So Namandani caste means a person a ma a mastering of all nine skills of nine skills of craftsmanship. So he has mastered not only on ritual, Ayurvedic uh, healing, medicinal, but also making costumes, even uh, the, uh, the slokas and the you know, traditional reciting, mask making, jewelry designing, uh, metal crafting, and uh, the, even uh, wood carving where we make, creates the mask and everything. And even this entire structure, this aesthetics, the architecture structure also, so there are nine skills involved and he must master all these nine skills to actually be considered as a master uh, of the Navandane caste. And he's the last artisans of the Madhara uh, tradition. And uh, aftermath of him, there is not many who are actually following. One of the reasons is because uh, there is not uh, much of funding or also support from the state and many people are not interested to move towards the art and art, uh, art learning. So that is there. But his uh, son, Pala Potipitya, is carrying certain power sectors of his tradition to make it, bring it to the contemporary times. So as you see, what he's wearing, this is an entire image, uh, a costume, uh, what, what he's wearing. So why do we wear these costumes? In the entire ritual, he's considered as the main Yakadura. Yakadura is the main healer or the performer who is the, the main healer and also the teacher. He handles and he is the one who's communicating with the entities. He is also the one who's going to heal the, the sick person. So this is the costume that the healer must wear. As you can see, the embroidery of the jacket, the upper necklace, the headgear, all of them, there is this particular aesthetic that is involved. So in Madhara tradition, they wear these jackets and certain times they don't wear, they also have bare chested. And then this uh, portion of the uh, bottom half, there is this uh, white cloth, a loin cloth. On top of that, there are three layered belt structure, a waist band that goes around. So we can move to the next slide. So you can see this is one of his jackets that he was cre he's creating and you can see the variations uh, at certain places the jackets are short at certain places the jackets are long sleeved uh, mostly the yakaduras uh, the main healer wears a short sleeve jacket which a little brooch uh, there is this um, sort of a history connection that the jackets 
move uh, start being born during the period of the early Cantian era, uh, because earlier they used to be bare-chested, and then later on the jackets were in influenced, and they started wearing. Could be uh, because of the uh, the Nayak uh, traditions from Kandy, but also there is this element that the Portuguese also have influenced uh, people to wear the upper covering the upper body. So you can see there are certain levels of this flora and intricate patterns. So I will kind of uh, explain to you about the, the patterns later on. Um, each pattern, which is elaborate, talks about, uh, has sort of a uh, sort of symbolism that connects with the cosmic energy. Um, certain patterns are there, they look floral and fauna. There are also patterns that are called the Nagavalya. Nagavalya is like, like swirls of snakes. Uh, they consider that connected to the Naga tribes that who lived in Sri Lanka. So we can move to the next slide. So here I'm going to focus on the waistband. So waistband, there are three sections of the waistband. So you can actually remove them. There'll be like three layers. And each, each of these layers are being embroidered and you know, be highly detailed. And the next important thing, what uh, my uh, Somapala Putupitya is wearing is called the crown. It looks like a crown, but this head gear is called Kagul. So Kagul or this head crown in Mbenthata um, and in uh, Ambalampura, in Mbenthata tradition, you see the kagul that is the headgear that is worn. It is made of coconut leaves. So they will uh, decorate the entire structure with coconut leaves. But in Madhura tradition, you see the structure of this uh, eight-sided crown that would come. So there are certain uh, symbolism how uh, the crown is also being created. If you go to the next slide, I will show you the in inner layer of how the crown is created. So the entire crown here is created by cane. The, entire, the structure for this particular cane uh, has to be taken from, uh, this only prevailed in wetland forests. So for, uh, for Pala and Somapala Potopedia, they actually uh, get these cane from this, uh, um, from this forest called Singharaja. Singharaja is one of the more, uh, one of the most uh, precious wetland forests in, in the world. It's considered as the uh, same history of Amazon. And uh, this particular cane is uh, it's so flexible. It's only, you can actually keep it for a long period of time and it, it can change its form. So the entire cargo or the crown structure is created by this cane. And then we see this intricate layering of, if you go back, I would like, someone to go back to the early slide, yeah. So if you see this entire layering that happens around the crown. So this is from base cloth. They will cover the entire crown and then they will create this uh, eight-sided section with these blossoming flowers. We call it the blossoming flower. So there are small, small intricate symbolism and also measurements that must be carried. So if someone uh, changes a bit of the measurement, the meaning of the crown totally changes. Even within, even within the embroidery, it is that. And now, uh, if you look at the embroidery, uh, if you can go back to the early slide. Yes. So if you look at this entire embroidery structure, from the edge, from the edges, to the inward. So the, the stitching happens from the edge to inwards. Uh, there are certain ways of carrying the embroidery. The measure, there is a section of measurements. So there are these things called muku. Muku are like swirls, uh, which I will show you how it comes in my work. Muku, there are things called muku, which is of uh, calculatively um, nine to 10 beads you have to use. Um, so, and there are certain areas where we have to use uh, different colors, like if there are symbolism for different variations of colors. As you can see, the jacket is made of yellow. 
so the yellow signifies the god natha so therefore to balance the jacket the colors of the beads has to go with the other gods that symbolize the other gods so there are four gods who are called the guardian gods so each time when we are working on this practice of embroidery we must always remember that the symbolisms the uh, the patterns and what it means is uh, symbolic and also how it's uh, connected with healing as well so i uh, can go down yes so here also as well we are seeing this so, um when it comes to um this tradition or uh, what i learned i am still learning with my mentor is that why does this ornamentation or this embroidery textile is happening is the reason is that the the main healer the yakadura uh, has to get connected to the cosmic energy so that he is able to sort of emanate that transcendence to the the sick person and the people around us so to connect with that um as entity the person has to able to absorb that healing or absorb that cosmic energy so as my uh, as my mentor has said uh, so mohala putti mentions that the embroidery and its symbolism sort of absorbs this cosmic energy into the body and transcends our body our soul into that ethereal being so can we move to the next slide so from here uh, i would like to talk about how um, the this tradition sort of engulfs in my work so here uh, it's actually a poetry of my uh, it was uh, translated from my mother's uh, saying how she saw the aftermath of war so she is written like when the war ended now we can breathe better the war ended but in short period of time we forgot everything we forgot everything that actually happened all those flesh we forgot this uh, in 2019 uh, there was this incident that happened uh, in in colombo uh, which is considered uh, of this uh, extremist attack on uh, in the christian churches on the easter sunday mass day and where many people have died and it was a uh, sort of a resonance to all sri lankans that uh, like after many years of struggling for thirty years of because of the civil war and civil unrest Uh, aftermath of it also we are still trying to build up a reconciliation and this incident happened so i kind of felt uh, very in connected uh, with this situation and uh, one of the reasons is that i used to go uh, to one of the churches personally kochi kadi church as a from as a child um i always felt uh, that presence of healing in that uh, place and uh, and i feel like there was this connection that i could work out um i wanted to sort of connect to these entities uh, and heal what is happening um so we can move to the next slide so during the entire if you see some of these images they are very uh, grotesque and brutal um this is a uh, some of the images that are built or uh, during the bomb blast you can see they specifically um sort of focused on the statues that are there and this is actually the flow uh, which is been built uh, that of those uh, reminiscences of the attack later on uh, what happened was the state implemented on creating a memorial within the church so how they kind of sort of bring in these sculptures that uh, had these reminiscences they were uh, of that attack and that pay uh, they sort of built 
within these structures of memorial. So this is an actual sculpture that is in St. Sebastian uh, Church uh, near the altar, uh, which reminiscence of what is happening, what happened on the Easter Sunday Mass. Uh, till now, we have not actually got any justice about what happened. Um, which let me uh, sort of connect with what happened aftermath of the war. What did happen? Because I was already working on the archivals uh, through my mother's memory to understand the, about the civil unrest. When I moved to Jaffna and also I moved to, tra I started traveling in the northern part of Sri Lanka, I realized certain memorials that are being created or being built by the state of about. Uh, the people who have passed on did not actually uh, create anything of healing. Um, if you move to the next slide, uh, there are like these screenshots of archives and this is some of them. So I actually went, traveled to Jaffna and you see these uh, burial grounds, which is on the first image as you see a pile of burial ground. So this is actually a memorial where they have actually destroyed this entire burial ground of the Tamil people or also the LTT people um, who, were, who died during the civil unrest. Um, and now the people around that area have collected all this debris and made into this sort of a shrine or a monument for remembering them. This is another uh, memorial that is being built within the University of Jaffna, which was demolished in 2021 during the lockdowns uh, that uh, within the time of the pandemic. And then you can see in the other corner, uh, there is this uh, sort of uh, soldier with the weapon, with the state flag, sort of, uh, you know, this is a memorial built by and funded by the state. Uh, to sort of you know their victory upon. So I have there's this diabolic uh, connection with what is to be remembered through a memorial and what is to be forgotten by a memorial. Whom are we actually trying to heal and whom are we trying to reconnect? Whom are we trying to sort of memorialize here? So this question drops to me when I thought about the new memorials that are started to be built within during the Easter bomb attack, after the Easter bomb attack within these churches with these statues as you saw earlier. How can, uh, why would state fund such an important thing to memo immediately create a memorial in, so into the architecture of a church? So we'll move to the next slide. So where here I want to open up. I used to visit uh, a lot at the Kochikade Church when these, um, new, this memorial was being built up. And uh, there is this uh, person who, uh, a priest, and as well there is this person uh, whom I know from childhood. Um, he used to be the candle uh, bearer. And he was saying that there are certain statues that they can't put. Um, into the memo, uh, into this new museum memorial that is being created, so they don't know what to do with them. Uh, that was part of the the uh, Easter bomb attack. So he, I asked him, what should I do? And he said that we are going to draw, throw them to, uh, we are going to throw them into the water rivers or under a, a, a tree. We should bury them, or we will throw them into the sea. So I did not want that to happen because I felt there's some sort of a connection that they held something so much of pain and trauma uh, in them. So I have collect. Uh, so they gifted me the first initial sculptures, and later on, uh, I started mapping and picking up these sculptures that mapped also of, of uh, incidents that have happened uh, during the eighties. Uh, there are no memorials built for the 88, 89 revolution as well, or or with, uh, you know some. Um, or what happened at the 83 Black July massacre. There are no memorials in Colombia that you sort of connect with the brutal history of uh, ethnic violence as well. So I started mapping these places with these statues and shrines that are built by people around them. Um, 
so we can this is sort of my statue archive <laughs> with uh, some of the statues uh, that i've uh, brought from the churches as i said i collected and then suddenly uh, people started giving me them but <laughs> they are all there here so we can move to the next slide so uh, as you see, uh, my entire work in the beginning, uh, it started with performance performances. So these statues used to be uh, part of my performances. And I used to work with brand, uh, my mentor to sort of create the costumes, uh, trying to learn uh, his way of interpreting. And I want to learn the technique of how do I create the crown? How do I bring these elements uh, of of his aesthetics, of the Southern curative traditional aesthetics of creating textile and attire into the performance attires and into my work. So in this is uh, where I moved in creating these performances where the sculptures started uh, being part of them. They are being sort of like entities. They were the entities that I wanted to communicate um, and they were also somewhere connecting to me as witnesses of some, something that happened, a tragedy or something that is happening right now. So you can see the sculptures and the performance are becoming together. We can move to the... Um, so there, these are certain uh, parts of the performance. Now you see the sculptures are actually entering as uh, performance ob objects of performances. Uh, so even the the cup, which which is all uh, that's the, the saucer, the sculpture was actually used with uh, during the performance, sort of a ritualistically drink something from the cup. Uh, so there is this. Uh, connection that the sculptures are being connected with the performances. So there were many people who participated uh, with the performances as well as my own mother who participated in the performances as well. So there is a particular character uh, I bring in called Nonchi. So if you go back to the previous slide, there is this mass entity uh, her name is actually known as Nonchi. Nonchi comes from the Southern ritual uh, tradition of performances only. But she comes from this branch from Benthar tradition, come from the Kolam. Kolam means mockery or mocking someone. So it is kind of a theater of humor, theater of absurd. So she is a character who is in the entire cast uh, of that tradition is considered as the mother figure. She has three kids and uh, her husband is a, the narrative goes as her husband is a drunkard and she has to sort of balance uh, her family and uh, sort of create sustainability. sustainability. She's also the nurturer and her character is very satirical as well. So I find uh, her one of uh, a, a, a mother figure, the entrance of a figure of, as a mother within the tradition for the first time. Uh, but all these characters and all these practices are only uh, practiced by cisgendered male. Uh, therefore, even this character of a feminine, uh, a feminine attribute is all, all performed by male gendered people. So we'll move to the other slide again. As you can see, the, the sculptures are entering. So if you move to the next slide, Yes. So here I would like to talk about each sculpture. As you see, they are connected in multiple ways to the performance. So as they are entities. So how do I connect them with the cosmic energy uh, that kind of transcends their body? So here the embroidery and the technique and the aesthetics of the embroidery enters into the work. You can see certain symbolisms of it. Uh, this is the St. Anthony statue. Uh, which is connect uh, actually it's named on, uh, from the place which is it has been collected from. Um, there is this triptych sort of a skirt like a fro uh, a frill kind of thing that is connect on the bottom half of the sculpture, which is actually the the as I showed you in the uh, actually the, this is another sculpture uh, composition as you can see uh, it has 
these three elements uh, connecting to each other. Um, we can move to the other slide as well. Yes. So there are also parts of uh, each of these cultures that I've collected throughout. And as you can see, whenever I'm placing them or, or composing them, there is a connection to the geometrical pattern. And also they, so, um, as I said, they need to kind of connect with the symbolism to the, the tradition, the aesthetics of the tradition. We can move to the next slide. So here uh, I would like to um, show, this is the actual, um, a photograph of the Kochikade Memorial with, uh, with the names, the shrine of the people who have passed on. And why I'm, the other site is actually a screenshot of, uh, there is a site that is created uh, for the, by the families for the justice of this trajectory. So this is a letter uh, written by the father uh, to his children, all of his entire family has died. And this letter, if I translate, it is actually saying that, you know, you're not alone over there because everyone, so his entire family and his extended family all have passed away. Uh, so he's telling that in this letter that he, they, they are together in that other world and uh, they are not alone. Uh, he's the one who is actually alone over here and he hopes that, you know, some way, one day that he could connect and he himself could feel connected and he could feel healed uh, and he's waiting for them. So throughout for 30 years and aftermath of war, there are many families, there are many parents, there are many uh, who are waiting for their long lost ones who are still not able to attain that justice or they are not able to finally you know, reconciliate or heal themselves. So there is this connection of whom are we actually healing and whom are we remembering. So if we move to the next slide. Throughout my entire this body of work, I'm trying to connect to that essence of, uh, you know, nostalgia, this about this remembrance, about uh, healing, where I'm trying to heal uh, bodies that uh, considered this, you know, they, they, they had some sort of pain and trauma and trajectory. When I actually showed this work, when I started working uh, for the first time and I showed this work to my mentor, uh, Somapal Putupitya uh, had said this to me that you know what you are healing, you're breathing in life to something that is dead, something that is gone through a tradition which is already dying. So you are giving uh, something life from something that is dying because he, after him he has this idea that there's no more people who are practicing it anymore. So there is this connection that I'm trying to create throughout this entire work. That is why it is called when flesh fades away, all you're left with the memory of them. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Dear Space, and thank you so much, Sume. I hope I didn't take all your time. Thank you, Chaturi. This was, um, sometimes, you know, I'm, I fall short of words. And this is one of such moments. This happened uh, when we had our first conversation and you were showing me your uh, pieces. That time you were in Delhi and in, you were showing me the pieces you were working on at that time. And uh, the stories you shared, uh, some of your personal stories as well. And I was, I, I got choked actually, you know. I was not really able to speak or, uh, is yeah so we have a comment uh, in the chat box let me just check that out uh it's from guru prashad day at first i pay my 
obeisance to the feet of Master Somapala Potupitiya. Ms. Chaturi, needless to say, your presentation is deeply thought provoking to me. A major thanks to T for bringing this intellectually problematic and enlightening discussion to us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dave. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of questions maybe, you know, or things that we can, uh, uh, we can think about. Uh, okay, so for our audience, you can uh, just mute yourself and uh, talk to the artist directly, ask your questions, uh, share your observation, or, or just uh, if you just want to appreciate uh, Chaturi's work and uh, you can just unmute yourself or write in the chat box. Um, so, uh, Chaturi, what I was thinking, and we have talked about this before also, uh, that, um, you know, you say that this tradition that is practiced in Matara and uh, Somapala Potipedia is the last uh, practicing craft person of this um, tradition. And you said that this is a very gendered practice. This is only done by the male. So you being a female and you being an outsider to that community, uh, how challenging it was to, you know, to own their trust and to enter that uh, their space because most of the time uh, this, this kind of indigenous practices are very secretive and uh, not shared with people from the outside world. So how challenging it was and uh, what, how, how was that journey? Mm -hmm. I think uh, first and foremost, I should appreciate his son, uh, Pala Kotipitiya. Uh, as, as he, as a contemporary artist, he, he brings his tradition uh, to limelight. And he created this pl uh, place uh, called Mullegam Art Center, where sort of trying to create this exchange as a platform. Um, there, when I connected to his father, I think um, it was it did not happen. I I wanted to sort of document uh, on performance art. That was the initial thing, and this happened very accidentally that I started working with him. Um, but I think it, it was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy to persuade him. I think he used to say that I, I was a very, uh, uh, in a very funny way, he used to say that I'm a very troublesome child, that I'm very persuasive, that I went behind him, that I wanted to learn it so badly. And I'm still learning. I, I, and I'm still uh, consider myself an outsider um, because there's so much to learn. Actually, there are so many things that are skill not only in, in this learning the craftsmanship, but also to know a history behind them. Each how each entity, uh, cosmic connections, and how it's coming within these attairs and the structure, the history of the structures of this attair itself. So I'm still learning, and uh, he's still uh, teaching things to me. Uh, however he knows and also I'm doing my own research to try to understand other roots that connect with this tradition as well. Um, I don't know, uh, he has said that I'm, I'm the first female sort of to learn but uh, <laughs> I don't know how that happened but I feel maybe it's some sort of connection that we had as artists probably that made him sort of teach me and yeah. Uh, thanks uh, Chaturi for sharing that uh, with us. So uh, I was also wondering that, you know, uh, since you are learning something that is uh, practiced within a community and you are kind of recontextualizing the practice, um, you are exhibiting this, you, you are also using them as props uh, in your performance. 
uh, you are using that technique to a uh, different uh, religious aspect. So I was wondering how does the community uh, respond to this or uh, do they know about your practice or you know how, how they look at it? I think uh, Somapala Putiputia, as my mentor, he's been very, uh, he's been very understanding. He tries to, he looks in a very wider uh, aspect, and he tries to understand why am I recontextualizing in such a manner. As I said, no, he used to see my sculptures, the early sculptures. He used to see it, uh, how I'm working on it and reworking on them. So as he said, no, he started seeing that I'm bringing uh, that i'm creating something i'm giving life to them that is what his way of connecting with me uh yes when it comes to performances uh with other i have learned nonchi from another mentor i try to learn uh, from another person or another artist and uh, the performance the movement of nonchi the character that i play uh but there they have very constrictedly said, restricted my uh, thing, saying that I'm not allowed to perform because I'm a woman. Traditionally, it is wrong. And uh, there are also things that, you know, that why question also, why am I not allowed? Why am I not allowed to? Because it has been taught in the curriculum or uh, here in, in universities to many women female, uh, but they are not allowed to carry it on this tradition. So I think somewhere I'm trying to discuss of uh, this kind of negotiate, like what does these binaries, who creates these binaries of genderness, male or female within culture as well, what creates that? So there is this utmost desire to sort of figure like research and figure that or or sort of recontextualize it as well so yeah right uh so um do we have any any question uh observation um ideas comments from our audience uh, please feel free to ask uh, your questions to Chaturi, uh, you can write in the chat box or just unmute yourself and uh, come up with the question. And uh, let me tell you, this is the last uh, presentation from the series that we were uh, continuing uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, and the exhibition is also uh, ending on 21st of August. So whoever is in Hyderabad, uh, if you have not seen the exhibition, please do visit. Um, if we don't have any any more uh, question or comments from our audience, then we can just um, conclude the session today. Uh, but before that, thank you so much, Aturi. I know uh, in the last few weeks, you have gone through a lot of uh, trouble and uh, uh, but finally you are you are back home and uh, in your studio and uh, I'm really glad that you know you reunited with your family and uh, now that you'll be able to continue your practice um, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your uh, beautiful stories your practice and a lot of things that uh, you know even after more many many conversations i didn't know like the slides you showed today uh it's, it's really an eye opening so thank you so much for sharing this and thanks to our audience lovely audience who uh you know every week join us and uh, encourage our artists to uh, share their stories their practice and uh, you are i'm really you know thankful to all of you because you are our inspiration you are our um, uh, reason to come up with such conversations with our uh, artists so with this presentation of chaturi nisan sala 
we are kind of uh, ending this series of talks. Uh, definitely, there will be more conversations, more uh, presentations by artists for other exhibitions. So for this exhibition, this is the last one. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much for everyone joining today. Thank you, Dee. Thank you so many. Thank you so much.